Welcome. I'm Steve Tackett of Grace Bible Network. We are very pleased to welcome you to this video class. We are proud of the quality of Grace Bible Network's online Bible studies and recordings available on both our website and YouTube. Whether you watch them online or just listen to the audio portion on your commute to work, we are glad you're here. Please enjoy the recording. Okay, welcome to the Monday Night Bible Study. And we are continuing with our verse-by-verse -verse study of 1 Corinthians. And we're still in chapter 1. And I'm going to just quickly go over a few things that I talked about last Monday night from 1 Corinthians 1, verse 17. Um, but before we do that, let's have a short word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all the blessings we have in you. We thank you so much, Lord, for uh, sending your son to die for our, die for us and to take our place and to take our sin upon himself and to give us his righteousness. We thank you, Lord, for his resurrection by which we're justified. Uh, Lord, we thank you so much uh, for showing your mercy and grace on such a wretch as myself and everybody in the world that's that needs your salvation we thank you for for so much mercy and grace that you've shown us and we just pray lord as we come to your word tonight that we would um uh be enlightened by it uh be edified by it uh be admonished by it be encouraged by it um that our faith would be stronger and that we're more confident in your word, more confident in our understanding of your will, your mind, your heart, and your purposes in our life. And we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. If 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, Paul says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. And we talked a little bit last Monday night about the fact that Christ did not send Paul to baptize, but he did send, he did send John the Baptist to, to baptize. If you hold your hand here in 1 Corinthians and turn with me to uh, the uh, Gospel of uh, John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1. These are the words of John the Baptist. And uh, let's look at verse 31. And John the Baptist says, And I knew him not, speaking of Christ, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore I come baptizing with water. So, Paul baptizing with water was to what? According to the verse, to make manifest to Israel, make Christ manifest to Israel. Because it's, it is Christ, the Messiah to Israel, that is going to fulfill the promise to Israel about a kingdom of priests. And if you have a kingdom of priests, one of the qualifications to be a priest in God's kingdom on the earth is to be water baptized. And you can read about that in uh, Exodus 19 and Exodus 29. But let's read some more of John chapter 1, verse 32. And John bare record saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him. Verse 33, and I knew him not, but that he should that but that he sent me to baptize with water. So very clearly we know that John the Baptist was sent to water baptize. But when you read 1 Corinthians, if you want to go back there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says Christ sent me not to baptize. So it's so obvious from these passages that Paul has a different ministry than 
than, say, John the Baptist, or even Peter. And we'll talk about that more as we go on here. But um, what I want to uh, go over again is the question, why would Paul baptize at all if Christ did not send him to baptize? So I have a theory on this. I think it's pretty good, but you can be the judge of that. Let's look at Acts chapter 19. Of course, you need to keep a marker in your Bible at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, but look at Acts chapter 19. And look at verse 4. Then said Paul, John, speaking of John the Baptist, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So water baptism is associated with two things in Scripture. It's associated with the promise to the nation Israel that God would make them a kingdom of priests. And, of course, Christ would be their king in that kingdom. And so believing in Christ Jesus and being water baptized are associated with one another. So a believing Jew under the kingdom program would believe that Jesus is the Christ. And so water baptism is associated with believing in Jesus Christ. Now, if you go back to 1 Corinthians and look at verse 14. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 14, Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Those are the chief rulers in the synagogue. They are Jews. Uh, and verse 16 says, And I baptized also the house of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. And the household of Stephanus is most likely the house of Stephen, which when we read about him in Acts chapter 7, he is also uh, a Jew who is preaching uh, a message to Israel that they need to repent, uh, just as Peter preached. And so water baptism would have been associated with that ministry as well. Uh, and so what I believe Paul is doing, if you'll turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 real quick, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, what I think Paul is doing is he is accommodating the limited understanding of the Jew uh, and the, the fact that they don't understand the new program, the, the dispensation of grace and the revelation of the mystery that Christ gave to Paul. He accommodates them in their weakness and he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. Verse 20, And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them which are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law of Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. Verse 22, to the weak I became as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now what does he mean when he says, to the weak I became as weak? Turn with me to Romans chapter... 14, Romans 14, him that is, notice, weak in the faith, receive ye, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputations. For one believeth that he may eat all things, and another who is weak eateth herbs. In other words, somebody is observing a dietary law. And where do you find dietary laws? You find them in the Old Testament. Verse 3, let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not, and let him not 
let not him which eateth not judge him that eateth, for God hath received him. So if you look at verse 5, he says, One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Uh, he that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for, and for he giveth God thanks. And he that eateth not to the Lord, he doth not eat, and giveth God thanks. So the idea is that somebody who's weak in the faith may think they need to observe some law or some ordinance. And that would certainly be true with the Jews because water baptism is associated with believing in Christ. So if these Jews that Paul baptized uh, were believing in Christ, they would be compelled to be water baptized merely by the witness of scripture, not by Paul, but by the witness of scripture. And so Paul may have accommodated them in, the, in that respect. Uh, in that context, he would say, okay, if you want to be water baptized, I'll water baptize you. So that's just a theory of mine. And you can, you can either accept it or not. It doesn't matter. Uh, but I, I think maybe that might shed a little bit more light on the subject. So let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And let's look at verse 17 again. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And now, um, one of the things that um, that is also true about this passage is that it's possible that because of verse 22, that baptizing Gentiles may be considered a sign to the Jews and believing Jews that God is dealing with the Jews just as speaking in tongues was a sign to Israel, to unbelieving Israel, that God is now going to the Gentiles. Because it says in verse 22 of chapter 1, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Wisdom. So if Jews require a sign, well, maybe water baptism was a sign uh, to those unbelieving Jews that God was dealing with the Gentiles. And so that's another possibility. But let's move on. The other thing about verse 17 is that we know that, as we saw already, that in Paul's early days of his ministry, he was baptizing some Jews. And um, the, the reason why he was doing that is questionable. It's debatable, I should say. Um, but by the time you get to Ephesians chapter 4, there's only one baptism that Paul is concerned with. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. The only baptism that matters today in the dispensation of grace is Ephesians chapter 4. And look at verse 4. Ephesians 4, 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. So there's only one Lord, there's one faith, and there is one baptism. And that cannot be water baptism. It is spiritual baptism. And how do I know that? Well, turn with me to um, Romans chapter 6. Now, one of the things that people will say about Romans chapter 6 is Romans chapter 6 verses 1 through 4 is proof that water baptism should be practiced because it shows you shows an outward sign of an inward change. Well, that's hogwash. Uh, 
Uh, I don't mean to offend anybody that's listening to this message, but that's just not the truth. Okay, that's just something that man has made up. Uh, and it's important to get this straightened out because it has to do with your identity in Christ, that you understand these scriptures. And it says in Romans chapter 6, verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not, as so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? See, it's, it's, it's not baptism into water. The verse has nothing to do with water. It's baptism into Christ. When you were baptized into Christ, that happened the moment you believed the gospel. You were baptized into Christ, and when you were baptized into Christ, you were baptized into his death. You died with him, was buried with him, and you rose from the dead with him. That's your identity now in Christ. As somebody who has believed the gospel, you died with him, you were buried with him, you rose to newness of life with him. That's your identity in Christ. Nothing to do with water. People read water into this passage of scripture because of man's tradition. And the Lord says, you make the word of God of none effect through your vain traditions. And that's what that is. It's a vain tradition. Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. The picture is what? You're literally buried into the ground, not dunked in water, you're buried in the ground, you're dead, you're buried, and then you rise from the dead. That's your position, that's your place, that's your standing in Christ. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And look with me at verse 13. For by one spirit are ye all baptized into one body, whether ye be Jews or Gentiles, whether ye be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. You are spiritually baptized into Christ's body. And again, that's nothing to do with water. That has nothing to do with being a member of a local church. That's the spirit of God because you know that it's this capital S, so you know it's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. The Spirit baptizes the believer into Christ. And that is the only baptism that you need. Um, you can't be saved unless you're spiritually baptized into Christ. And that happened at the very second you believe the gospel. Um, another verse on that would be Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Turn with me to, to that verse. Colossians chapter 2. And I want you to look with me at verse 10. And ye are complete in him. If you're in Christ, guess what? You're complete. You are complete. You're not missing anything. The moment you believe the gospel, you're put in Christ and you're complete that very moment. And ye are complete in him, verse 10, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Who performed that circumcision? Who performed the circumcision of verse 11? Is that a physical circumcision? Obviously not, because what does it say? It's a circumcision made 
without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Christ is the circumciser and he has circumcised your old man from you and now you're the new man. Look at verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. And we just read from Romans 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 what that baptism is. It is his baptism, not water. Christ's baptism, the baptism of the Spirit into Christ. Wherein also you're risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. See, it's the operation of God. You didn't do, it wasn't anything that you did. Okay? It wasn't a ritual that you participated in. It's done by God. And you had nothing to do with it. For the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead and you being dead in your in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quick and made alive together with him having forgiven you all trespasses so the baptism the one baptism of ephesians chapter 4 is that spiritual baptism that you have to have to be saved okay if you were not baptized by god's spirit into christ then you're not saved, okay? But see, it only happens because you believe the gospel. Because you believe the gospel, God does the rest. He's the baptizer. He's the justifier. He's the circumciser. He did that all on your behalf. And he, because of the cross, because of the cross of Christ, he is your sanctification he's your righteousness he's your baptizer now let's go back to first corinthians chapter one again and i need to make this crystal clear even though i i know that most of my audiences knows this frontwards upside down and backwards but for the benefit of those who may not know, may not understand, I'm going to go over what the gospel is again. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Okay. And by the way, what does the word preach mean? Does that mean you have to stand uh, behind a pulpit and scream and yell at people or do you scream and yell them on the street corner okay i know i'm being facetious but you don't have to scream and yell to preach the gospel because preaching simply means it simply means to be uh to persuade someone to accept something that's what preaching means you're you're trying to persuade someone that they should accept this thing or this person or this idea that's what preaching is and so when you preach the gospel you're trying to persuade someone to accept the gospel so let's go back to the verse Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. What is the gospel? It's right here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved. If ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, lest ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. 
That is the gospel. That is the only gospel that will save you. Believing, put it simply put in your faith in what Christ has done for you on the cross and nothing else, and he will save you. Now, people object to that message, but that's what the, the word of God says. Okay, it doesn't matter what anybody else believes. It doesn't matter what how you feel about it. It's what the word of God says. You, that's the whole gospel right there. Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. Now, you say that's too simple. Okay, well, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, if you understand that he died for your sins, then you understand that you're a sinner. Okay? If you don't believe you're a sinner, if you don't believe in hell and and sin and those things, you don't believe you you don't believe you're so bad you, you need to be saved, well then you won't be. Okay? It's that simple. You have to see yourself as the lost sinner that needs to be saved, and then you just believe the gospel and he saves you. It's that simple. It's that simple. Now, we know that that does not include water baptism, does not include any kind of work of any kind. In fact, if you go back to chapter one, notice what he says about um, with the wisdom of words. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17, it says, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, semicolon, in your King James Bible, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. See, how he ties baptism with wisdom of words. Because the world has a wisdom, the world has a philosophy, the world has a way of thinking that's contrary to scripture. And we'll be getting into that in more detail later on. So what would be an example of worldly wisdom that would make the cross of none effect? Well, number one, by adding works such as being water baptized or telling people that they should be baptized in obedience to Christ which is not true. If you learn to rightly divide the word of truth, you understand that, that Christ did not tell us to be water baptized. Now, again, that may be offensive to some people, but reason people believe that they're being water baptized in obedience to Christ is simply because they don't understand how to rightly divide the word of truth. It doesn't make them bad people. It doesn't mean they don't have faith, but listen, we need to understand the word of God. We need to understand it clearly. And we need to, so we need to learn to rightly divide the word of truth. And when we do that, we come to that understanding that Christ did not tell you to be water baptized. Okay. He didn't tell you to do that. He told the kingdom saints, he told that to Israel. He said that, to Israel that they would have to be water baptized as a condition to be saved. He told them that they would have to be water baptized and they'd have to baptize all nations when they were sent out uh, with the kingdom message. But that kingdom message was interrupted by the dispensation of grace. So the message is different now. We need to understand. We need to rightly divide the word of truth and understand in, in the message, the ministry, and the revelation that Christ gave to the Apostle Paul, it did not reclude, include water baptism as a requirement for salvation. But it did. It did make it clear in the kingdom program to Israel that water baptism was necessary for salvation. He makes it very clear. 
Um, turn to Matthew chapter 28 real quick. Matthew 28. A passage that everybody knows. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And those all things included the observance of the law. He tells everybody that they must observe the law. He, and he tells his apostles that when they would go to these other nations, to tell them they must obey the law of Moses as well. It wasn't just water baptism. It was the law of Moses that they had to obey. And the apostle Paul makes it clear. In fact, I counted at least 20, 22 references in Paul's letters making the point that we are not under the law. But here in this so-called, you know, what they call the Great Commission, it is it requires the believer to follow the law. Uh, and water baptism is, is required under that system. Look at Mark 16. Mark 16. Verse 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, if you don't believe in what you're not, also, you're not going to get water baptized if you don't believe. So believing and being water baptized are, are directly tied to one another. You can't separate them. You have to be water baptized under the kingdom program, and you must observe the law. So, the wisdom of words that he's talking about is the worldly wisdom. So, if you'll go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, when he says in verse 17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made in an effect. So, again, he's associating works with this wisdom, with this wisdom of words. Man has a way uh of being philosophical and coming up with his own ideas about how the gospel should be preached and it ends up with wisdom of words not god's wisdom not god's wisdom but man's wisdom worldly wisdom is what he's talking about um we must Rightly divided word of truth. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want you to notice when you look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, we read the verse that so many people know and quote. Verse 15 Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But notice the verse before that. In verse 14, he says, Of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. See, when you strive about words to no profit, profit well, there you, there you get into this whole thing about wisdom of words and man's wisdom. And if you do that, if you end up striving about words to no profit, what does that do? It leads to the subverting of the hearers. You're subverting their faith. When you play with the Bible and Bible say, well, this doesn't mean that and this means this. And what God really meant is, oh, and it's so unfortunate that we're using this King James Bible. We should be using the NIV because it's more clear. Striving about words to no profit. When you do not rightly divide the word of truth, 
and you do not take the, the what the words on the page say as they say it, then you're going to end up striving about words to no profit. Trying to make the Bible say something that it doesn't actually say. Trying to take the doctrines that Christ gave to Paul to teach the church and mixing them with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and other Old Testament books like that. So going back to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, the gospel is clear. Do not, do not add or take away anything from the simplicity of the gospel. Then it goes on to say in verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Now, they ask you a question. Did Peter preach the cross? Well, yeah, he preached the cross. Peter preached the cross and Paul preaches the cross. But how do they preach it? Does Peter preach the cross differently than the way Paul preaches the cross? He does. He certainly does. Turn with me to... Um, well, first of all, we're going to go to Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 3. But before we go there, I want you to go to Mark chapter 9. People will say that you find the gospel of our salvation today in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And that's simply not true. They didn't even know that Christ was going to go to the cross and die for them. Now, it's true that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John gives an account of that event. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John give an account of the events of Christ being crucified, buried, and rose from the, raised from the dead. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John does not present that as the gospel. It does not. Mark chapter 9, Mark chapter 9, verse 30. And they departed thence and passed through Galilee, and he would not that any man should know it. For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and after he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him. See, they had been preaching the gospel of the kingdom all over Israel for three years. And then, then after that, Christ tells them that he's going to be crucified, buried, and raised from the dead. And they have no idea what he's talking about, and they were afraid to ask him. See, they were not preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for their salvation. They didn't even know anything about it. Okay, now let's turn to Acts chapter 2. After Christ is crucified, buried, and is raised from the dead, he then explains to his disciples that this is a fulfillment of prophecy. See, they didn't understand the prophecies about his death, burial, and resurrection. They, those prophecies didn't mean anything to them. They had no idea what they meant. Acts chapter 2. Look at what Peter's preaching. Look at what Peter preaches about the cross of Christ. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, 
ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. See, this is Peter's message. It's not a good news message of, hey, Christ has now died for our sins. And by, by grace through faith alone, we can be saved. No, that's not Peter's message. It's an, a murder indictment against the nation Israel for crucifying their Messiah. He says, verse 23, him being determined by the, uh, delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. Look down to verse um, 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seen this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus, excuse me, this Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we are all witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith, Himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand, till I make thy foes thy footstool. See, Peter's message about the cross is that it was prophesied that he would be crucified and that he would rise from the dead and that one day he would sit on David's throne and he would make his enemies his footstool. Nothing about salvation by grace through faith. It's not there. That message is not there. So it says in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel, because that's his only audience, is the house of Israel. Let the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made this same Jesus, whom we have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men, brethren, what shall we do? We've, what shall we do now? We've crucified our Messiah. Now he's going to come back and he's going to judge his enemies. How do we escape this? How do we escape this judgment? How do you do that? Well, he says, Peter says in verse 38, Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you. What are they repenting of? They're repenting of crucifying their Messiah. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, when are they, when are they going to have their sins blotted out? Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, Peter is still preaching in Acts chapter 3, and he says in verse 19, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. What is that? That's when Christ returns to earth. That's when they get their sins blotted out. Verse 20, And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all these holy, holy, all these holy prophets since the world began. Okay, you see that? They get their sins blotted out when Christ returns to earth and sets up his kingdom and defeats his enemies. You and I who believe the gospel, we are not waiting for Christ to return to have our sins blotted out. They are already blotted out. Different, Paul's got a different message, a different ministry, based upon a new revelation from Christ that he received beginning in Acts chapter 9. You need to understand that. Now, let's go back. Let's go back to 
1 Corinthians chapter 1. And he says in verse 18 again, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Well, who does he say are those people that would think it's foolish? Well, if you look at verse 23, he says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. It's a stumbling block to the Jews because why? Because they're self-righteous. They're self-righteous. Look at, keep your hand here, look at Romans. Chapter 10, Romans chapter 10. Verse one says, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. See, the, to, to, the preaching of the cross to the Jews is a stumbling block because it's without the law. And they want to establish their own righteousness. Now, on the other hand, with the Greeks, it's foolishness. The Greeks are, you know, I mean, we could fall into the category of Greeks because we're Gentiles too. And in the culture at Corinth, uh, Greek philosophy was very popular and people paid more attention to the Greek philosophers than they did to Paul or anybody else preaching Christ. And so Paul comes along and he's teaching that salvation is strictly by faith in what Christ has already done for you on the cross without works. And the Greeks say that's foolishness. They say it's foolishness. It can't be that easy. Believing that because some man died on a cross because he was crucified and he shed his blood and that he rose from the dead the third day, that can save us some, some, that can save somebody? They just laugh at that. They think that's foolish. And so the Greeks thinks, think it's foolish. The Jews think it's, thinks it's a stumbling block. So verse 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. People that say that just preaching the cross and the cross alone for salvation is foolishness because they don't believe it. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power of God today is being put on display through people just believing the gospel and being saved. And the moment that they simply put their faith in other faith, in just what Christ did for them, God saves them and he gives them his righteousness and makes them complete in him and gives them and blesses them with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. That's the power of God on display today. That's how God primarily displays his power. He says it again in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, for it says, says, uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. It doesn't say to everyone that gets baptized or joins a church or uh, quits all their bad habits. No, the power is in the cross to save. Only in the cross. Is there any power to save? And it hasn't lost any of its power. The problem is people's hearts. People's hearts are hardened to the truth. And God doesn't need anybody's help in saving somebody. 
if they'll believe the right gospel, he will save them. We can't help God in that process. He doesn't want our help. He doesn't need our help. We just believe the gospel and he does it all. And if we try to add anything to that, uh, we're the one that's wrong, not him. All the power to save, all of God's power is being displayed in the cross alone. So it is 835, so I'm going to go ahead and close for now, and then we'll pick up at verse 19 next Monday night. Thank you. Hello again. Hope you enjoyed the recording. If you liked it, would you please help us with our YouTube ratings? Would you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel? You can unsubscribe anytime you like. It helps us reach more people with the teaching of the word rightly divided. For more information on our online Bible classes, please check our website at www.gracebiblenetwork.org. We are a nonprofit entity supported by our ministry partners, and we will never solicit donations. This is God's ministry, and he always provides for our needs. Remember that God's grace is a gift itself, freely given us through his son. His grace is sufficient to save you from all your sins. But only if you have faith in what Christ has already completed for you on your behalf. He died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day for our justification. Thank you very much.